Good morning uh, and good afternoon, everybody, from wherever you're joining us. Apologies, we had a bit of a technical issue, uh, hence the slight delay in the uh, in the live feed. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Maha Yahya. I'm the director of the Malcolm H. Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center based in Beirut. Um, we're the, the panel today will be looking at China and the Middle East. In recent years, as many of you know, China's footprint in the Middle East has grown. While traditionally focused on economic engagement, Beijing has become more involved in regional political and security issues. In response to the crisis in Gaza and the Red Sea, China has called for de-escalation, but refrained from playing an active role in conflict mediation. Earlier in 2023, Beijing helped broker a normalization agreement between Iran, Iran and Saudi Arabia. So today, this panel uh, discussion, this conversation, we will be tackling uh, how Middle Eastern countries view China's shifting foreign policy and what are their priorities with Beijing. We will also be looking into what are China's goals and ambitions in the Middle East and how will China-Middle East relations evolve in the years to come. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our two speakers, Dr. Hisham al ghanna who is Director General of the Strategic Studies and National Security Programs at Naif Arab University for Security Sciences in Saudi Arabia, and Dr. Jin Yang Jian, a Senior Research Fellow at Shanghai Institute of International Studies. This, as I uh, said earlier, will be a moderated conversation. And I'm going to start with you, Hisham. If you could paint for our audience a general picture, how do Middle Eastern countries perceive <clears throat> China's recent involvement in regional political and security issues, especially in light of its traditionally economic focus? The floor is yours, Hisham. Hello, um, I'm very glad to be here in Ramadan Kareem. Uh, one hour to go till breakfast time, so uh, <laughs> hope we finish before that. So, in the, um, I mean, in my opinion, in the near past, there was this, um, what I call an exaggeration of the size of the Chinese role in the region, especially the political one. Does China view the region as a major area, arena of conflict with America and other uh, global powers? In my opinion, the, the, the simple answer is no. Um, there was no comprehensive Chinese policy for the region. It, it differs from one country to another, but certainly uh, the Gulf, the Middle East, is an area of competition for China with other great powers, but it's not a main battleground for the Chinese. And this is uh, this is a, you know, a huge difference, and this could change the future, the near future. But currently, this is this is what we have now. The most important interest of China in our region is definitely oil, and this has been the case since the 90s. It's the principal interest, and will remain so. The rest of the interests, uh, the Chinese goals are marginal to this roughly around 45 to 50 percent of gulf oil goes to china but as uh, for the chinese influence and the balance of power in the region this may seem uh, uh, strange to say but there is no indication that china wants to play an influential role in our region yes we have a growing chinese community presence that china wants to protect uh, but what else i could add also that china also sees the region as an entrance a door to the acquisition of Western technology, whether through Israel or the Gulf, for them the region, but um, the region is, is not more than that. It's not a wrestling arena in which they can play America. They're, uh, they're concerned with their immediate region. They have an increasing interest in Taiwan, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. The entire Korean Peninsula problem has not been resolved. They have very bad relations with Japan. The largest country on their side, Russia, is involved in a quasi-global war, and their relationship with India is not good. They have a very tense relationship with the, with the Five Eyes, with an increased pressure on China and several files, Taiwan, the Uyghurs, and others. And regardless of who rules America, uh, the Chinese policy is based on this expected uh, tensions with Japan, the European Union, and America. And this will continue with us. The bottom line here is China have interest in the region, but the region is not pivotal in their major battles. It's not part of their grand strategy. And, and for all these reasons, 
uh, uh, I would still say that they want and they uh, and they need to have an excellent working relations with their main oil suppliers, specifically uh, the Saudis. However, I would not simplify the issue by saying that America is withdrawn from the region and China will replace it. I think this will be very superficial and will distort the whole uh, reality. On the other hand, you know, and I was in China recently, if, I, if you allow me to end with this, uh, if you listen to the Chinese discourse, you will not hear uh, um, the imagined alliances that are equaled by the axis of the so-called resistance in our region. Uh, the Middle East is not a fundamental interest of China, and no one should exaggerate, I think, the Chinese power uh, and role in the Middle East. Um, would you give me one minute more to just... Um, um, Half a minute, like, Hisham, because I want to move Hisham. to that region. Okay. Because okay. I want to speak of why, why Saudi Arabia and also other Middle Eastern states generally find China they, foreign policy appealing. Look, and, we, um, we're coming, we, we have time to unpack some of these issues during okay, the conversation, okay. if you like. Uh, because we will be sure. coming back to a bit more to sure. unpack the relationship between China and uh, the Middle East, uh, the kingdom in particular, other areas of cooperation beyond the oil. So we will come back to these a little bit sure. uh, in, in, the, in the conversation. Um, Jin, let me move to you and ask you, sure. uh, from China's perspective, uh, we heard Hisham talk about uh, how the Middle East is important but not strategic. Uh, so from China's perspective, what are China's primary goals and ambitions in the Middle East, particularly given its increasing engagement in political and security matters? Okay, thank you very much for taking me as part of this discussion. Uh, I would like to interpret your question as uh, a kind of what kind of drives or momentums behind China's policy toward the Middle East or what kind of structure, what kind of guiding structure China has for its policy in the Middle East. I would like to say that China's policy toward the Middle East is one part of its overall international policy. Uh, when we talk about this issue, I would like to say that uh, we have some, we do have some guiding principles or guiding frameworks for this. Uh, the uh, overarching structure is that we propose to build a shared future for mankind. That is the over, overall structure. And this umbrella, we have three initiatives. Uh, the first initiative is a global development initiative, and then global security initiative, then global civilization initiative. And, uh, and these are the guiding principles. For instance, development, global development, it favors develop, development. I think we are developing mutual, mutually uh, uh, develop, uh, uh, mutually supportive uh, development policy, okay? And also in security initiative, we have uh, several concepts. For instance, we try to build a common, uh, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security. And uh, uh, civilization initiative, I would like to say that the core of that is mutual respect among civilizations, okay? And uh, these are the general principles, but I would like to say that we also have a, a very immediate and direct interest. That is, I would like to say, economic interests. And the way we think the Middle East is a, a very important market for China's products. And we also think that the Middle East is one of the major sources of our investments. Okay. So, uh, yeah, because of this economic interest, we think that peace and stability is very important in China's calculation of the Middle East policy. I think that uh, we are trying to, we are seriously promoting peace and stability. We want the market to be very stable. And also as a major uh, major country, uh, one of the powers, okay, I would like to say that China also cares about its international image, international responsibility. Uh, I would like to say, for instance, yeah, 
uh, when uh, Arab countries and, uh, and also Western countries, including the United States, would always say that China should play a, a responsible role in the, okay. uh, the, the in the region. Yeah, we we are living up to our commitments, our responsibilities in the in the in the in the, in the Middle East. Though we have different ways to define the responsibilities. Okay, okay. I'll just stop here. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back to this, but I want to move back to Hisham and ask you, having heard what uh, Jin just said, um, particularly on you know an interest, Chinese interest in economic stability or instability in the region, given the uh, volume of economic trade that they would they have and they would like to increase, um, what do you think are the key security concerns in the Middle East, and how does China fit into the regional security landscape? And just kind of a small add-on to this question, I would ask you, who is closer to China, uh, Saudi Arabia or Iran? I think there are three interconnected strategy, uh, strategic security concerns uh, uh, that, uh, that China can relate to, and it's important for the kingdom and many other Arab countries. Firstly, there is this... Uh, the ongoing Israeli occupation of the Palestinian Arab land, which has escalated tensions in the region and brought it to the brink of a broader conflict beyond the Gaza and the West Bank. Secondly, there is the issue of the spread of nuclear weapons in the region, with Israel already possessing nuclear weapons and Iran nearing a nuclear capability. This situation would certainly encourage others, such as the Turks and the Saudis, to purse nuclear armament. Thirdly, the existence, I think, of numerous armed and state actors backed by Iran, I think poses a threat to Arab states and undermines uh, stability in general in the region. And addressing these strategic security challenges requires a comprehensive strategy. For instance, resolving the Iranian nuclear program necessitates addressing Israel nuclear capability. Similarly, tackling the proliferation of armed non-state actors requires also addressing the road causes of, uh, that enable their existence. However, the current approaches uh, such as the NATO-like defense pact, which the U.S. proposed, do not offer, I think, a comprehensive solution to these security concerns. Mm -hmm. While such uh, pact may enhance the kingdom's security to some extent, it does not address the core security issues. In contrast, I think the Chinese advocate a different approach to regional security. They emphasize uh, cooperation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. This approach has, as we have seen, has led to a significant uh, mediation efforts aimed at reconciling the two states. Um, unlike the U.S., China has shown no interest in establishing military bases in the region until now. Its approach holds a potential uh, uh, for resolving conflicts, as seen in Yemen and Syria. But China, political involvement in the region, I think, remains limited. Similar to the U.S., China lacks a comprehensive security strategy that addresses the main security challenges in the region such as the ending the, the conflict in Gaza. And um, if you would allow me, I would also, um, uh, I think that the, the advantage that China has over, let's say, uh, uh, other global powers, especially America, China's foreign policy closely aligned with those of many of the Middle Eastern countries. Unlike the US, I think China's foreign policy principles uh, as the uh, my uh, colleague have alluded, are grounded in values such as the respect of sovereignty and territorial integrity, and aggression and interference, mutual benefit, and peaceful existence. Uh, China also has refrained from interference under the pretext of or facade of protecting human rights or promoting democracy. And it's also avoided employing double standards in international relations. At least this is how the states and the region views China. So it's not strange that these aspects make China foreign policy more attractive to leaders in the Middle East. Uh, okay. I think you also asked me about uh, for, which is closer, what? Saudi Arabia, or, Saudi Arabia or, Iran. or Iran. I mean, this is, this is a very difficult question. What we hear is that Iran is much closer to China, but I would, I would make the counter argument I would say that Saudi Arabia has invested a lot in its relationship with China in order to, to make it more institutional. It's now the most largest, uh, I would say the largest and most distinguished in the region in terms of scientific and economic cooperation agreements with China. 
Uh, but likewise, Saudi Arabia has, all, has also the same level of cooperation with the U.S. and also the European Union. But I think that uh, the Saudis have succeeded in building what is called oil security with China. One, at least one and a half million barrels of Saudi oil goes to China. Uh, the, the oil factor is becoming more important with time, not the other way around, especially with the signs of uh, various energy crises in China. I mean, that the Chinese economy is recovering now. Another important point, that you also now have a very large Chinese community in the Gulf. And, uh, um, and, an, and, um, and, a, and a very working and a good relation between the two is important. If a crisis occurs, uh, happens, an escalation with Iran, for instance, or, or I mean, other parties in the region, there must be an infrastructure and a certain arrangement to deal with it and protect the Chinese presence, like what happened in Yemen, Libya, or Africa. Um, okay. And I think that the, uh, that, that I think it's a, it's a big, um, it's, it's, a, it's a fantasy, it's not proven by evidence that China and Iran have this special relationship. It's, I think it's very exaggerated, especially in terms of the volume of Chinese investments. Um, that Hisham, have, let, me, let me just... Let me just do a quick follow up with you on this, on, since we're talking about uh, China and uh, sorry, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, yes. How do you see the what do you see the impact of the rapprochement uh, between the two countries that China brokered on regional dynamics? I mean, we've heard from or I've heard from Chinese uh, from Saudi Arabian policymakers that actually the rapprochement uh, has been, you know, quite important in uh, sidelining or keeping trouble away from Saudi Arabia, particularly over the past uh, few months, over the past, since the outbreak of the Gaza conflict uh, I think and, it, you know, and the events in, in the Red Sea. And I, I think it was a major success, especially with the recent crisis in Gaza. Uh, mm -hmm. We're seeing that you know, without this, if, if there was no deal between the two, you wouldn't see... Uh, you would see a, a much higher escalation in the whole region. I think it was okay. a success, and I think there there is such it's going too it, fast for many uh, that there is this um, alignment between the two. I think. Between but the has it and had and an countries. impact on regional dynamics? I mean, we're seeing Iran's non-state actors still operating operating across the region. So, what kind no, of impact has it had on the ground? Maybe no, is my question. No, no, Nobody was expecting that it um, it would change the okay. the region radically. It's a slow and a gradual process, a step for okay. a step. No one is okay. expecting much more than that. And if uh, I mean, uh, um, I mean the same the same thing that uh, I mean. Uh, I mean back to the recent crisis. In my opinion, China. Uh, I, I will add the Chinese factor here. China also has aligned its policies with many of the Arab countries. It's, it, it has called for immediate ceasefire in Gaza, similar to the Saudis and Iranians. It also advocated the establishment of Palestinian states. A state is a, the only viable solution to, enduring, okay. uh, to, the conflict, to end the conflict uh, between uh, the two parties, the Palestinians and Israelis. But uh, uh, we are not, I mean, uh, uh, we did not see any, much anymore. Uh, I mean, I mean, um, we did not see, uh, we did not see from China what would we expect. Um, um, okay. Uh, I mean that. Uh, so. Um, base. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that uh, what I want to, when I want thus far, has China did not take any action that would, for instance, uh, end the war really seriously in Gaza. So it has we called for de-escalation, but has taken no action in a sense. I mean, I mean the whole region. The whole region expects China to actively support the, for instance, I mean, the, uh, yeah. the UNRWA much more. You will, you would. It's easy to criticize the U.S., but many believe that China, with its substantial resources, should have also contributed to the aid efforts of the Palestinian refugees, and we're not seeing that. Okay, so basically, uh, even though on the political front, it is China is aligned politically at least uh, on the surface with the demands of Saudi Arabia, Iran and many other countries in the region for a sea calling for a ceasefire, calling for de-escalation, for calling for the entry of humanitarian aid. It has not followed up 
with actions um, that can support these calls. So, Dr. Chin, let me turn to you and ask you, I mean, you've heard what Hisham said. China has certainly called for de-escalation in response to the war in Gaza and the Red Sea. How does China balance its interests in the region with its non-intervention and stance? Uh, excuse me, can you uh, repeat your repeat question? Repeat the question. Okay. I said you've heard what Hisham said about you know China's alignment in terms of calls with, with countries in the region, with calls for a de-escalation, an immediate ceasefire in the, in the, in the war on Gaza, uh, as well as, uh, you know, the Houthi attacks in, in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how does China balance its interests in the region with its mm -hmm. non-interventionist stance? I mean, what Hisham is saying is that mm -hmm. China is making all the right mm -hmm. statements, but it's mm -hmm. not intervening mm -hmm. in any significant way, mm -hmm. neither mm -hmm. economically to support uh, UNRWA, nor to actually uh, take other actions that would force mm -hmm. a ceasefire or mm -hmm. that would uh, hold mm -hmm. the attacks uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the Red Sea. OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I would like to answer my, the, this question, but um, with my response to uh, questions, uh, to the answers given by Hashan, our yes, Saudi of course. friend. Okay. If, and, if I uh, can just actually, if I can just also tack on it, maybe just to broaden it a little bit, is yeah, for yeah. you to engage also with how China. I mean, given given what we've just described. In that mm. sense, how is China really viewing its role in promoting mm. diplomatic solutions for regional mm. conflict, particularly mm. in the Middle East mm. in this case? Oh, okay. Uh, I would like to say that, 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 that actually there are a lot of questions here. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to say that uh, uh, Saudi-Iran reconciliation is uh, very, very important for the region. I would like to say there are a lot of uh, conflicts in the in the region, but the the, the the conflict between or the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia is one of the major defining feature of the region. But by, 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 by bridging the reconciliation, I think we can, we, uh, we kept a kind of a modest stability in the region. We, uh, we uh, make a, we, pre uh, we, we stopped uh, the, continuing uh, confrontation between Saudi and Iran in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria, and in uh, uh, in Bahrain, in a lot of uh, the, the other fronts. I think it is a very, very important, okay? I would like to say that it particularly benefited Saudi Arabia greatly. And uh, I would like to say that Saudi itself has a very strong momentum for the reconciliation because uh, Saudi is having a very ambitious uh, vision, the vision of uh, 2030 and the uh, big project. Without a kind of this kind of reconciliation, you cannot uh, uh, implement all these kind of big projects and the agendas. And uh, for this kind of reconciliation, yeah, we we see that Saudi Saudi Arabia is on the right course to implement these uh, uh, agendas. And also, the last year we have seen because of the reconciliation, many people say the the prospect of stability in the region. So they, but they they most of the business people from China. From uh, uh, United States and from European countries went to went to Saudi Arabia and the other GCC countries. A lot of delegations visited, business delegations. I think it is uh, uh, benefited the Saudi Arabia greatly. And uh, when we talk about uh, yeah, when we in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Ar our friends in Saudi Arabia would always complain that China uh, have a, a closer relations with Iran. But when we are in Iran, the Iranians would all say, "Why you are sided with with Saudi Arabia?" I think this, I think the, the, both of this, both of these two arguments are wrong. Okay, actually, I think China uh, tried to maintain a balanced and uh, good relations with uh, uh, both of 
uh, that the two countries in the in the region, uh, Saudi Arabia. You are a very good friend of China. Iran, Iranians are also a very good friend of uh, of us. I think that uh, it 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 reflects a kind of expectation uh, of more support from China for <laughs> for Saudi Arabia and Iran. But we, yeah, Maha asked the question: How how do we? Uh, 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 maintain that uh, uh, play a role in security issues uh, while keeping the nine interference policy. I think that we did play a, a big role in this uh, uh, in this regard. Yeah, we have different ways. Uh, we have different uh, mindset. For instance, we talk about common, mm -hmm. cooperative, comprehensive, and sustainable security. Okay, yeah. In, in some way, I would like to say the Americans' way promoting security in the region has actually failed. I'm sorry that I'm very honest. So the Americans would like to, yeah, we are going to protect uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, please, uh, uh, allied with uh, with uh, with the United States. Yeah, we can protect you. But that puts Iran on the other side of the story. It makes Iran very much angry. Iran is not satisfied with the statue being always targeted by the United States and the Saudi Arabia. But our our principle is different. We, we, we think that the security should be should be something common and comprehensive. Okay. Yeah, we our point is that yeah, the security issues sh should basically be mastered, should be someone of the regional issue. The regional countries should talk about it, that issue. What we can do is that the outsiders cannot just stand by, but we what we can do is to push you for a dialogue. We push you for a dialogue. And uh, in some way, uh, the, to play a big role, economic, economic and the political uh, capitals to push forward this kind of dialogue. Yeah, I strongly suggest that uh, Saudi and the Iran, yeah, you can you can have a dialogue, and uh, we can try to bring it, uh, bring you together, put you together, and and th that is also the way to make a peace, okay, to make a security, and also for the for the Gaza issue. Actually, I I should say China has already uh, sent uh, aid to Gaza. And uh, I think we have we have materialized all the amounts of aid. Uh, we we materialize. We are very serious. Yeah, you 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 might have heard a lot of numbers, but but not necessarily that not necessarily means that they they really materialize. Sometimes they they materialize. Only something like ten percent or twenty percent of of the aid, but we materialize okay. all this aid. Okay, I will just let, stop here. Thank you. Let me. We will come back to this because I also want to ask you um, what lessons Beijing has drawn from the way the Gaza uh, experience has been handled. But we before we get to that, uh, actually, maybe if you want to respond to this, and then I'll move to Isham with a couple of other questions. Okay. Do you want to respond to that, Dr. Yeah, sorry, the question what is are, what are Yes, what are the lessons that China has drawn from the way the conflict mm. in Gaza mm. has been mm. handled and, and, and addressed? Uh, I would always, I would like to say if, uh, uh, I think China do not need to to reflect on lesson. It is not a lesson on, on on China. Okay, we are. I think we are. No, from the way the, the world, the way the world, or the that, global that, yeah, community. Me, okay, uh, and uh, uh, for many decades, consistently, we have been seeing that uh, the. Uh, the Palestinian issue defined by Palestinian struggle for its legitimate for their legitimate course of nationhood 
is the core of the Middle East agendas. We have been seeing these kind of things for dec decades consistently. If you check all the statements between China and the Arab countries, and you can find this kind of uh, statement. We still think that it is. And uh, uh, several years ago, when many people, when particularly academia, those people in academia would say that uh, the, the Palestinian issue is sidelined. But we still think that the Palestinian issue should not be sidelined. We should put it at the core of the region agenda. Okay. That, that is what, but we, what we are doing, we tried, we tried with our influence, particularly in the UN platforms mechanisms. We tried, we, uh, we have done a lot of job to do that, push for UN to pass resolutions. We push for Arab unity, uh, push for Arab reconsidering the issue. Okay. But the problem is that I think in this way, if I'm not offensive, Americans, is, it is American, it is because of Abraham process, Abraham Accord, that has sidelined the agent of the Palestinian issue. But I would like to say that the, the relations between Israel and the Arab countries should be normalized. But I, I would like to say it should be, not be uh, 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 normalized with the sacrifice of Palestinians' legitimate mm -hmm. court. That is uh, that my point. And uh, we have pushed for a lot of agendas, but unfortunately, all these agendas have been blocked by the United States. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for, for us to play a role, for the aid to gather. But the, the biggest problem is not the number of the aids, is not the number of the assistant, but the seize file. No seize file. The blockage. Okay. 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 We will we will come back to this. Um, Hisham, let me move to you. I know you want to maybe comment on what uh, Jin just said, but I also want to ask you if you can speak a little bit to the. Uh, I mean, Middle Eastern countries have diverse priorities and relationships with China. So perhaps can you shed some light on the varying perspectives within the region regarding China's shifting foreign policy and its bilateral arrangements, uh, both on foreign policy, but also in terms of bilateral uh, uh, economic and trade agreements? Sure. Um, I have to say that I agree with many of what my colleague have said and it's not only eight uh, also regarding the red sea china have abstained from joining the u.s coalition in the red sea but the whole point that we think that they can do more we we understand that china's strategy is um, is based on promoting economic and security cooperation among countries of the region mainly between the iran and saudi arabia this is very clear however uh, I think that this is supported by evidence. China's involvement in resolving issues like the Palestinian issue and also the nuclear issues in the region uh, remains extremely limited. This approach, I think, contrasts with the expectations of many Middle Eastern countries. I think they desire more active role for China in address, addressing these regional challenges. And, and it, um, it appears to me, and for I mean, many others, that China focuses its efforts where it believes it can make a significant impact while overlooking areas while, where its influence may be limited. This is the Chinese strategy. For instance, China uh, saw that the U.S. was the primary influencer, influencer in, the, in Israeli affairs. Um, so it thought that, I mean, that the mediation efforts may not yield substantial results. Consequently, China may prefer engagement where it perceives a higher likelihood of success, similar to what happened last March of last year between the Saudis and the Iranians. However, I think Middle Eastern countries, including Saudi Arabia, expect China to play a more proactive role. They hope China will leverage its relations with Israel, because the Chinese have very special relations with the Israelis, to exert pressure and contribute to ending the conflict. I mean, uh, how calls for ending the occupation are insufficient without active engagement 
and facilitating the resolution. And the Chinese are very capable in doing this. I think there is a growing expectations uh, for China to take a more assertive stance and actively contribute to resolving long-standing conflicts uh, in the region. Um, what was your uh, other question, Maha? Uh, uh, no, my other, I mean, I think you answered the questions. I was asking mm -hmm. you whether, um, basically, I, I wanted to know more about the uh, diversification of relationships. Um, and especially from a Saudi perspective, how is that? How easy is it to diversify relationships? Uh, Basically, in light of increasing technological cooperation between China and the Kingdom, for example, sure. how will the Kingdom respond to greater U.S. pressure on this front? I mean, the, the prevailing sentiment in the Middle East in general is that a, a multilateral world order will, would be better to serve the interest of regional countries compared to a, mm. a unipolar or bipolar framework. I mean, this is very clear. Many states in the region, including Saudi Arabia, would welcome greater Chinese involvement, as I said in my previous comments, given that Chinese China political outlook often uh, aligns with uh, that of Middle Eastern countries. However, uh, the nature of China's trade relations varies across the region. For countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, maintaining a strong economic ties with China is imperative due to the significant impact on their citizens' well-being. Uh, Saudi Arabia in particular relies heavily on China as its primary trade, trading partner. Bilateral trade between uh, the two countries has, um, I mean, has seen substantial uh, growth, reaching more than 105 billion in, in 2022, compared to only 73 billion in uh, pre-corona in 2019, mm -hmm. and almost 419 million in 1990, when diplomatic relations were were just established between the two countries. Uh, the Chinese export to Saudi Arabia is around 39 billion, uh, while imports from the kingdom uh, total, I mean mainly oil, is 66 billion. Given this economic interdependence between the two. Saudi Arabia cannot afford to comply with, with certain U.S. demands uh, that may strain its relations with China, such as imposing constraints on bilateral ties in exchange for, let's say, a NATO defense pact. I think this is a, this is a fantasy. It wouldn't happen. In the, in the event of a future confrontation between U.S. and China, Saudi Arabia position would, 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 uh, would be very different than, uh, than for instance, Europe which seized oil purchased uh, from Russia in response to geopolitical tensions. Unlike Europe, Saudi Arabia cannot afford to halt its oil exports to China. Other, also, other Middle Eastern countries with uh, uh, that uh, sell their oil or gas to China, they will follow the same um, Saudi position. But maybe other countries with less significant trade relations with China may respond differently, particularly if their security interests align closely with those of the U.S. Um, okay. Jen, thank you, Isham. Jen, let me turn to you and yeah. ask you a question. Basically, given the complexities of the Middle East, how does yeah. China approach building trust and partnerships with countries in the region? And what, does, what challenges does it encounter in this regard? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's always a challenge to keep a good relations with the, uh, the con con with the countries in the, such a complicated region. Uh, but I think China has success, uh, su su successfully managed these kind of issues. I think the way we have uh, uh, we uh, it is because that we have abide by. Uh, some very good principles. We are still uh, adhering to this kind of principle. The first kind of principle is that uh, mutual respect among civilizations. We would always like to talk about adherence to the uh, principle of respect among civilizations. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we talk about, uh, we, we never have a something that's creating the region the, the the religion we do not have we we have nobody born in Quran. we have no male treatment of 
prisoners, all these kind of, we have no blood on our hands, okay? Uh, we never interfered into that domestic uh, politics of Middle East countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran, or other countries, we never interfered. We respect the, the political systems, they have children, they, the political, the development the path they have children. I think this is mutual respect among civilizations. And also in security issues, we, we talk about uh, common security. We we think that you yourselves, the regional people, regional country are relevant. You should take, take care of your security issues. We try to persuade, promote this kind of dialogue. And uh, for Saudi Iran, the, the, the reconciliation, reconciliation. I think China will continue to to play a role to invest in political and economic uh, efforts in this regard. But I I would also like to say that uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, you yourself should also, yeah, have a kind of dialogue. Let, and uh, let, yeah, let me let me just come in with two questions from the audience that are relevant mm -hmm. to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. One is from Sophia Data, who's asking, is the Israel-Gaza conflict a point of U.S.-China contention, given China's support for Palestine and the U.S. support for Israel? And then tapping onto this along the same theme uh, from Neil Patrick, saying, how much does China's military and intelligence relationship with Israel give it leverage in support of you know, China's desired uh, desire for Palestinian statehood? He also asks another question, and maybe this is for Hisham uh, or, or Jen, if you want to mention this, uh, in terms of what is China doing to mediate day-to-day -day between Iran and KSA mm -hmm. over uh, the Red Sea security, especially mm -hmm. given Asarullah's challenges to mm -hmm. the free flow of trade um, since the official ceasefire. So if we can just respond to those questions and then we'll wrap it up because we're going to start running over time soon. Okay, uh, let me take the question. Okay, uh, whether the Palestine, the conflict between Palestine and Israel is a part of China-U.S. confrontation. Okay, mm -hmm. that is, is it the first question. Uh, I would like to say it is not a, a confrontation between China and the United States. It is not an issue between China. And the, 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 I think it is a confrontation between what is right and what is wrong. Okay. When we talk about the Palestine issue, yeah, we, we think it is a, it is something about the occupation, okay? Occupation. Uh, I think we are right, okay? Uh, the the fire is burning in Gaza. We talk about a ceasefire. Who is right? I think China is right. We, we are talking about a ceasefire. We are talking about a two state solutions. But Americans, I think, uh, they, they talk about two-state solutions. They talk about two-state solutions, solutions defined by Palestinians enjoy a very minimal sovereignty. But we think that the Palestinians should have full sovereignty. Otherwise, there will be no peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it is a confrontation between what is right and what is wrong. Okay, well, so can can China can China leverage its relationship with Israel, the military and intelligence relationship? Does this give it leverage to we, encourage we, this kind I, of? Actually, we we I don't think that we have uh, the, the, the military and intelligence uh, the relations okay. with Israel. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the, in my in my knowledge, in my knowledge, okay. About in the year 2000, in the, two, the, the fair kind issue, okay, the fair kind issue, because of American pressure, Israel canceled that 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 that, mm. that, that project, okay, and then in the year 2006, the happy June, China bought from Israel, but China returned it to Israel for updates, but because of mm. American pressure, Israel uh, sent it back. Send those happy drones back to China without any updating. Okay, and also in the in recent years, uh, because of American pressure, Israel gave up, uh, 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 stopped, suspended the the the, the qual qualification of a Chinese company to bid for uh, uh, to 
we build a, a plant of uh, uh, something, uh, water plant, something like that, okay? And also because of American pressure, Israel hesitated for the project, the Haifa new terminal, something like that, okay? So that is uh, what we know. Yeah, I, I don't think that China has a, has a uh, even modest uh, such kind of cooperation with Israel. Okay. Okay? But I think we define our relations with Israel as a uh, comprehensive partnership of uh, innovation. Comprehensive partnership of innovation. I think it is basically mutually beneficial. We think that uh, uh, that Israel should do something reasonable. Okay, I will just stop here. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Jen. Hisham, let me turn to you with a final question. How do you see or foresee China Middle East relations evolving in the coming years and decades, considering the geopolitical dynamics and regional challenges, many of which we've discussed today in this panel? Okay, I'll make, I'll make this brief, but I just want to say that uh, the truce in Yemen preceded the normalization between Saudi and Iran. The normalization mm -hmm. with Iran served to reinforce diplomatic progress. This is the main outcome of the whole normalization process between the Saudis and Iranian. And I think this is a major outcome and a great success in that area. So just not to, uh, we do not want to exaggerate what the outcome of the normalization between the two states, but this is what happened. Now what's happening in the Red Sea, I think this is, this is, this is a different issue than what's going within inside Yemen and between the, between the Houthis, Ansar Allah and the Saudis and other uh, Yemeni factions. I just wanted to comment on that. So this is related to what my colleague have said, but also what uh, what one of the audience have asked about. Now, when it comes uh, when it comes to um, um, the way forward, uh, I think uh, while not all Middle Eastern countries share equally strong trade relations with China, the preference for a multilateral world order remains, I think, a widespread throughout the region. It's not only, uh, it's not limited to the Saudis or the Gulf states. Given the substantial volume of trade, specifically between the Gulf states like Saudi Arabia and China, I think that the relationship between uh, the Middle Eastern countries and China will deepen further and rapidly. Uh, in the case of, of Saudi Arabia, for instance, the partnership with China extends beyond trade and uh, it includes um, collaboration in various sectors including nuclear, uh, energy, space exploration, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, robotics, renewable energy, construction, telecommunication, and the weapons and arm industry. If this trend of cooperation persists, as I expect, I think China is likely to emerge as a significant or probably the most important player in the region's economic and strategic landscape. However, mm -hmm. the potential for, co for cooperation could be also uh, threatened in the event of a conflict between China and the U.S. Yes, it's important to note that no country in the Middle East stands to benefit from being drawn into such conflict. Saudi Arabia specifically is very aware and worried of that. As such, the trajectory of cooperation between Middle Eastern nations and China will continue, I think, and flourish, driven by mutual interests and shared uh, objectives across uh, virus demands. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that... Um, that this would be an easy task. Um, I mean, the raised, uh, raising the slogan of diversifying the basket of partnership and alliances does not come without pitfalls uh, and traps. Uh, but I think mastering the balance between different superpowers is definitely, it's, it's not an easy matter or governed by a clear equation from beginning to an end, but it's a must, especially for the states uh, in the okay. region, specifically the Saudis and the Gulf states. Thank you, Hisham. Dr. Jen, any last uh, comments before we close the, the panel? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I would like to take the last opportunity. I think that uh, uh, China-Saudi uh, China, uh, relations is uh, certainly very important. It's, uh, it is basically uh, mutually beneficial. And uh, China regards Saudi Arabia and other GCC countries as a kind of uh, uh, very important market and the sources uh, for investments. And, uh, but for Saudi Arabia, I think uh, China is uh, 
means a lot, really means something for uh, your agent to diversify your economy. And I e would like even to say that China is the sources, the, the, the one of the factors that determines whether Saudi Arabia can maintain its prosperity. Uh, as China is still growing, uh, it, it, it's increasing its import from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, by oil. I think that um, uh, you, you, we, we, but uh, I, we, we Ch Chinese never pressured Saudi Arabia to do this or to do that, uh, to do this or to do that because of, of economic relations. I think economic relations are, are actually mutually beneficial by, by nature, mutually complementary by, by nature. But China, US competition, I think Americans are defining the competition as a kind of pressure from the United States against the, uh, the uh, for, uh, for Saudi Arabia and other GCC countries, not to do this uh, with China, not to do that with, with China. But we Chinese never say that you should not do those uh, business with Americans. We would always say that uh, we, our relations are mutually beneficial, mutually beneficial. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Hisham. Thank you as well for joining us thank today. You. Thank you to the audience uh, for what for me was a very insightful discussion. Uh, until the next one, have a lovely afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.